Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced and welcome to another episode of Catalogs, Manifest, and Metadata. Oh my! And uh, basically, again, we here we talk about open source stuff, particularly we're talking about Apache Iceberg for the first bundle of episodes, but eventually we'll get into other open source projects like Nessie, Apache Arrow, and others. It's just each, each time we're doing a series of episodes that are just sort of little bit by piece, uh, deep dives into these technologies, so what they are, and what do they provide, and what they deliver. And in this episode, we'll talk more in depth about Apache Iceberg catalogs and sort of like this oftentimes can be sort of a, a very sort of confusing discussion when people want to adopt Apache Iceberg. It's probably like the biggest thing you have to decide. Once you decide this, it's pretty smooth sailing from there. And in the future, it probably won't even be uh, that big a deal anymore. And I'll explain why. You'll understand the whole deal. So in the previous episode, I started talking about this distinction between service catalogs and um um, what's the word I'm looking for? Service catalogs and file system catalogs. There's really only one file system catalog, and then there's several different service catalog implementations. And when I say service catalog, all I'm saying is that you have a mechanism that tracks your different Apache Iceberg tables, basically matches a name. So let's say table A to a specific location in your storage where the current metadata.json is. Okay, now the original sort of way that catalogs were sort of implemented is that there was sort of a Java abstract class. So for those who aren't familiar with how Java works, is you can create like um, a abstract class, which is like a class where you have the definitions for all the needed methods. So all the functions that need to be inside this object. And then basically any implementation of that abstract class would then basically define those functions. So essentially what happened is that if you wanted to create a catalog, you would take that class and then create a version of that class that implements all those functions. And long as your, basically your class satisfies that contract, has all these methods and all these methods return the right values, take in the, take in the right arguments, then technically you could just use that class as your catalog and that mechanism could be the way you track Apache Iceberg tables when you use the Apache Iceberg Java libraries. Okay, so essentially, it, took, it was a very Java first approach. Okay, and this works. Basically, you know, then you had many different catalog implementations that would create a catalog class. You had a JDBC class that would allow you to connect any uh, JDBC store, so any database really. You had a um, Hive implementation, which allowed you to use Hive Metastores as a catalog. You had a, um, you have a Nessie catalog implementation. Nessie is an open source catalog, uh, basically specifically made for this type of use case. Um, that also has a Git like features. I want to be doing several episodes on that later on. So stay tuned, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends about the show. And basically, there are several others for like DynamoDB, AWS Glue, uh, and then anyone could kind of make their own. So there was, so basically, anyone who kind of had their own way they wanted to store their iceberg catalog information, they could implement their own custom catalogs. The problem is, this contract is only in Java. So once you get to Python and you start creating like PyIceberg, the the Python iceberg implementation. Well, you have to kind of rethink how you do that because if I remember right, Python does not have abstract classes. So you have to essentially create like a parent class and not everything is going to be perfectly analogous. So now you have a different sort of slightly different contract for how a catalog should be defined. So it becomes less, so basically every catalog class has to be re-implemented in Python. So it basically as you move from language to language, all this stuff has to be kind of re-implemented. Okay. Um, which is fine for most catalogs. Most catalogs now do have a Python and Java implementation, but now you have a Go Iceberg library that's being developed, a Rust uh, Iceberg library that's being developed. Um, so you and then in the future, you, who knows what other Iceberg libraries may get developed? Um, you know, as as the project evolves. So this then begs the question: How can you create a way um, to deliver these catalogs that? doesn't create this friction between different languages. And I'm going to get sort of back to that um, in a moment. Because first, I want to kind of get back to that. So that was all about service catalogs. So this is all about how service catalogs, you're running a service, and this thing that's constantly running can be communicated to by your tool that's doing iceberg transactions to know where your iceberg tables are at. That's fine and good. Uh, but there's also a file 
system catalog implementation. Oftentimes, not my favorite name, but the, its official name is called the Hadoop catalog because it was originally written with sort of using Hadoop distributed storage in mind. But really, it works with any storage layer. So you can use it with like an S3 or ADLS. It's just any file system. So I, 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 it's, so I think of it as the file system catalog, but it's officially called the Hadoop catalog. Okay, and the way this catalog works, and again, it has its own Java class and its own Python implementation, um, but, but instead of communicating with this external service, so instead of sending a request like, so to some other server, some other service that is sort of your catalog and saying, hey, where is table A? What's gonna happen is that it's gonna assume that there's a folder called table A. Okay, so it's gonna be like, okay, well, if I'm looking for table A, there must be a folder called table A. And inside table A, there's like 20 metadata.json's. How am I supposed to know which one's the right one? Well, in that folder, there should be a file called version hint.txt. And that version hint.txt is gonna have the name of the, 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 the current metadata.json file, and then the engine can then go from there. Okay, and that works. And then if you're using, you actually are using Hadoop distributed storage, then that's fine. You can use that. I mean, even for production purposes, and you should be fine. Um, but then when you get to things like S3, there isn't the same guarantees when you update files. Okay, so when you start getting into object storage, not all object storage have, and different object storage implementations have different guarantees, and some don't have a guarantee that you can that there isn't the possibility of like concurrent rights to update to the same file. So essentially, you could theoretically have two people update the table, update that version hint dot text at the same time, and create different conflicts as far as the evolution or the history of your table. Okay, so generally, this file system catalog is not recommended for production, in particular when you you imagine that you're going to have concurrent writing, because you might again have multiple updates to the table happen at the exact same moment, and cause this particular issue um, depending on the storage layer that you have, which is why generally a service catalog is going to be preferred because those are going to be able to manage that scenario better. Because they'll generally have some sort of mechanism. They usually have some sort of backing database that'll lock, or, or it'll have its own locking mechanisms. You you'll get that because that's generally how sort of those concurrent writing guarantees are made in Apache Iceberg. It's through the catalog. The catalog is very much the mechanism for uh, asset guarantees in Iceberg. Okay, because the idea being that you know the catalog is the is the is the uh, place of consistency. Everyone's going to read the same version of the table because the catalog only refers to sort of one metadata.json at the point in time. Okay. Um, so that is sort of the distinction between a service and a file system catalog. The second thing to understand is, again, the evolution sort of like where things are kind of going far as how catalogs are going to get implemented. Okay. So essentially now there is a open standard interface for how catalogs are implemented through a REST API called the REST catalog. So the REST catalog isn't an actual catalog implementation. So you can't just say, hey, I'm using the REST catalog today and whatnot. You would need an actual catalog. So it could be any of the catalogs that was mentioned before could work through the REST catalog. There are adapters that allow you to take one of the existing Java classes and run a service that uses this REST catalog interface. But essentially the idea is this. It doesn't matter what language the service is written in. It doesn't so it doesn't have to be a Java class that gets developed in order to, to use this catalog. All that matters is that the catalog is a running service that has a REST API that has all the specified endpoints and they work based on the contract that is the open API spec. So basically if you have a running service that implements this REST API specification, then that's your catalog, okay? And the beauty of this is that you can make, you can use the same catalog in Python, in, in Java, in Go, in in Rust without having to re-implement those classes because it technically it doesn't, and you could actually write the catalog in languages that aren't even any of those. So I could theoretically write a catalog in JavaScript um, that suddenly then works with your, your Java application because they're not communicating through the programming language interface. They're programming through uh, HTTP requests to the REST API, which is always acts as a universal way for applications across all languages to talk to each other. 
Okay, that's generally how the web works. Okay, so that's the cool thing there. So in the future, okay, you already have a few catalogs that support the REST catalog. Okay, most of them are generally currently behind a vendor. Okay, so you have um, Tabular, which is a company founded by the creators of Iceberg, um, who created Iceberg back in Netflix. You have a Unity catalog, which is a catalog from Databricks. And you have uh, Gravitino, which is an open source. It's not a specifically an open source Iceberg catalog. It's an open source just... It's, I'm, still, I'm still wrapping my mind around that one, but it, it does a bunch of other stuff, but also allows you to track Iceberg tables. Um, but you already have an adapter that exists, so if you wanted to use things like Nesty, so you can use those, which is an open source catalog implementation that has those Git-like features, you could you know, run a service um, through this Docker container and you just would put the Nesty class in there. And what it does, it has a it runs a REST API server that uses that, that Java class. And you can swap it out with any of the other Java classes that exist. Okay. But you know, in the uh, probably in the future, all any in all the official catalog implementations will have a native REST API implementation of some sort. Um, well all the service catalogs. Like I wouldn't imagine, I don't know if they'll ever come out with sort of like a native JDBC REST API implementation, probably just that adapter will probably be how you would do it. Or you would just create your own custom thing. But this also makes it a simple interface for anyone to kind of, again, create a custom catalog implementation in any language that they like. Okay. They don't have to just depend on the, hey, are all my tools Java? Because I have to do everything through a Java class. And that's kind of like the beauty of sort of that design decision. But it's very early stages right now. I think right now the, the the REST API is on V1, and there's a lot of big proposed changes to it that are actually going to be for the better. Okay, the one that I'm most excited about is something called the um, scan plan endpoints. And the cool thing about this is that right now the way these catalogs generally work is that the catalogs just relay one question at a time. So basically, uh, like a catalog or something like Dremio would sit there and say. Okay, can you give me what the metadata, where is the, where is the metadata.json for table A? And then Dremio would get the address from table A from the catalog, and then basically Dremio would then do its do, do its planning. Okay, um, so the, basically the planning of the query would be done for be done by each specific engine, and each engine might do it in a different way. Um, so you'll have you know you have different, and then you have different performance of that that that. You're going to have performance affected by two things. The way you plan the query. So how does how does the engine use that metadata to plan the query and narrow down the list of files from that metadata? Okay, just because the data is there doesn't mean the engine uses it. And two, you have the layer of when the actual engine scans the data. How does it actually process, scans that data and, and runs the query on that data? The, the scan plan endpoints, what they're going to do is offload and say, hey, you know what? We'll take that work. We'll take the, the 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 query planning part or the scan plan, meaning identifying the number of files that need to be scanned. We'll take that part off the engine. So instead of having the engine do it and then every engine doing it differently, well, you, the catalog can then decide to do the planning behind the scenes and then just return sort of a list of files and just say, hey, these are the files you need to scan. Okay, this has a couple cool implications. You could have a catalog that has a really optimized way. To, to do the scan plan, um, or one that takes advantage of different mechanisms like caching and whatnot to improve the speed of scan planning, okay? Um, because the catalog may be aware of how often it's been requested while engines wouldn't be aware of other engines requesting that same table, but the catalog is, requ- of it is aware of all what all the engines are doing. So in that case, it could theoretically cache, hey, you know, I have this table hasn't been you know, the last time this table was accessed was this and it was for a write. So, you know, and invalidate, you know, a cached plan based on, uh, you know, hey, the, the pointer's been updated. So you can do stuff like that um, while you couldn't really do that at the engine level because you don't know if some other engine, uh, you know, updated or accessed it recently. And co- other cool thing is that you can have non-iceberg things in your catalog because it doesn't matter whether the engine understands like let's say you have Apache Hoodie or Apache Delta table in your catalog, 
then it won't matter because what happens is that the, using the metadata to determine what files are scanned is not the job of the engine. So the engine doesn't know how to do it. It, it would just be a matter of whether the catalog knows how to do it and the catalog just returns the list of files. Um, and then again, the query engine then just goes access those specific parquet files and does its querying, which again, can have a lot of profound benefits as far as like, hey, what can be tracked by these catalogs? Uh, two sort of opt ways you can optimize the performance of these catalogs. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can be doing here. But again, all the, how that endpoint is going to work and look like is still being decided. And chances are a lot of these discussions need to work themselves out before a lot of catalogs go and implement the rest spec. So it's still early days. Okay. Um, and thinking through sort of like the catalog world. So honestly, at the end of the day, it is not, it's not hard to switch between catalogs nowadays. So oftentimes like, you know, using something like Dremio, which has its integrated catalog, um, works pretty well with most tools and is pretty well integrated into Dremio, or, you know, you might be using one of the other catalogs I mentioned along the way. That all, well, it works fine and good, well and good, pretty well right now. Like you shouldn't hit too many, too much friction, um, you know, and again, that friction will be completely eliminated once everyone is kind of agreed upon in this sort of uh, REST specification and has adopted it. But, um, you know, there's a part of the Nessie project is they actually created a CLI tool for you to be able to register, uh, basically move tables from one catalog to another. So not a hard thing to do when you decide, hey, I want to switch catalogs. You should only have one catalog at a time because if I have the same table, in mul you can have multiple catalogs, but any individual table should only be in one catalog. Because when a table gets updated, right now the way all engines are going to work is they're going to only update the catalog from which they access the table. Okay, so imagine I have catalog A and catalog B. Right now they're in sync, so they both know that, tab th that they should be pointing at metadata JSON number five. But then I update the table through catalog B. Well, catalog B is now referring to, to metadata six, while catalog A is still referring to metadata five. So be queries coming into these two catalogs for the same table are going to get inconsistent results. So how do you avoid that? One ta any individual table should only be in one catalog. Okay. Um, because again, you want to keep, you know, you don't want multiple copies of that reference because that's just more references to that table that you need to now keep in sync. That can be a challenge, but you know, again, this may sound a lot more complicated than it seems. But the way I would put it is if you want to see how easy, you know, just working with an iceberg catalog and how it's not something you even have to think about. Um, what I would do is I'm going to put a tutorial in the video description of like how to build a lake house on your laptop. When you try that, you're going to be using Apache iceberg and using a Nessie catalog. And you're going to realize like you really didn't have to think much about it. You probably don't even realize, notice you're using it most of the time. You're just kind of operating with your data in your data lake, like it's a database and it feels pretty easy to use and seems, seems really simple. But if you've worked a lot with data lakes and have seen how things have been done in the past, you'll see that simplification is really transformational, really profound. So uh, look for that in the in the uh, description wherever you're watching this. So with that, uh, that wraps up this episode. I'll see you all later.